Dr. Solveig's uh, a professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Alberta. His research focuses on providing new screening techniques for retinal diseases and using nutrition to prevent AMD. Uh, he's part of the choroideremia gene therapy trial that we've talked about so much. And uh, uh, he's going to talk to us today about foods and vitamins recommended for people living with age-related macular degeneration. Eve. Thank you. I want to thank Sharon for giving me this amazing opportunity to uh, share what we find out uh, in a lab, an enclosed environment where I'm allowed to be socially dysfunctional and hide myself with my mice and my rats. And uh, having done all these studies uh, until I was perhaps, I think, 40 years of age when I got my very, very first independent position at the university, believe it or not. I remember my father asking me, when are you going to get a real job? When are you going to get a house? When are you going to get a dog, a lawn to mow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so, so research uh, is, is a totally a vocation, I would say. On, 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 uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be happy. So I'm happy to wake up in the morning and have some amazing challenges. And you represent the outcome of, of what I do, the end point. So John was eating his sandwich and doesn't want you to look at him while he's eating his sandwich. His mouth is full uh, as we speak, and he's red. And then please don't look at him. He is involved in a study where uh, John is a medical doctor from Greece, and uh, he approached me uh, last year to work on a clinical study where we are going to, and uh, we've started, make relationship between lifestyle, especially the food that you eat, and the progression of AMD, as Dr. Mark Grieve um, was perhaps most of the people who are here attended Dr. Grieve's session, and some, I see some familiar faces over there. Um, I don't think I saw you at Dr. Grieve's session, so I will repeat a bit what Dr. Grieve said, that AMD is a slow condition that develops with age, in which you lose your vision, and that presents itself as two stages, the dry form followed by the wet form. So 85% of people have the dry form for which we don't have a treatment, and the other 15% have the wet form for which we inject these anti-VEGF agents, Avastin and Lucentis, and another one coming soon. So our job, John and I, is to prevent the dry form from evolving into the wet form. As long as we can keep it dry, this is the least severe, then you can have useful vision and do not have that black hole in the middle that Dr. Cree was talking about. So what we do is we enrolled patients who have wet AMD in one eye and dry AMD in the other eye. If anybody in this room has injections only in one eye, then I urge you to contact Dr. Demopoulos, John, who's right there, and give your name to John and your contact numbers, and John will enroll you in our study. So what is this study? This study is a variation of a study that is ongoing that Dr. Grieve talked about called ARADS, Age-Related Eye Disease Study, ARADS. ARADS started a long time ago and established that antioxidants called lutein and zeaxanthin, Z-E-A, X. A-N-T-H-I-N, zeaxanthin, um, these two antioxidants are pr preventing the progression of dry AMD. 
Okay? Now Arads is moving towards a second phase called Arads 2. Very nice tuke. And Arads 2 is adding DHA. DHA is a form of omega-3, which I talked about. So people in this room heard me speak this morning, most of them? No? No, you didn't hear me speak this morning? I have Patty Pete. You didn't hear me speak this morning? Ah, Patty did. This gentleman didn't. Okay, so most people didn't hear me speak this morning. So I'm going to repeat what I said. Wonderful. Okay, great. Wonderful. All right. So DHA is very important to, um, to your eyes in order to transform the light signal into an electrical signal. And that's how your brain gets to understand what all the visual signals mean because the brain speaks one language and it's electrical signals. So you need to transform light into electricity. And that is done at the level of the retina. So you heard about the retina. And uh, if you want, I'm just going to take you there. And we're going to take a little trip together uh, in the retina. So if you feel comfortable, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and to feel your eyelids. And as you feel your eyelids and you can move your eyes left, right, up and down, you will feel something. And what you're feeling is your cornea. The cornea is the very front of your eye. And your cornea is very, very sensitive. And you need that cornea for focusing the image. So that's why I know Patty Ann had some cataract surgery, because they became opaque. Uh, that was the lens, in fact, that was opaque and not the cornea. So we're moving now inward. So you are still closing your eyes, if you wish. And then you're moving inward towards you. So you have your cornea. Then you have the lens. The lens is what focuses the light also. And then you move towards you more inward in your eye. And you're in the middle of your eye right now. And you're in a bed of jello. It's all jello. It's all jello. You're in the jello right now. You're swimming jello. It's really comfortable. And it's called the vitreous. The vitreous. Okay? I want you to move forward, forward in, 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 until you're at the end of your eye, at the back of your eye. And there you will meet a structure called the retina. It's half a millimeter thick, no more than that. And I want you to enter that retina. I want you to get inside. So it's like your balloon, and you're at the very wall of the, ma the balloon inside. You're still inside. And the first thing you're going to see is many white fibers. These are nerves. And you're going to move forward, uh, further, further, and you're going to see cells that are called bipolar cells. And you're going to move even more inside, and finally you arrive at the cones and the rods. And I want you to stop there, and you can open your eyes. So the cones and the rods is what you use to transform the light into electricity. And they're called photoreceptors. Photo for light, receptor for receiving. So they are the cell that receive it. And in order to do that, they need a fatty acid called DHA. It's a form of omega-3. So omega-3 is a family, a family of fatty acids that members of the family might be familiar to you. Flax, flaxseed oil. You heard of flaxseed oil. You didn't hear about flax. Nobody heard of, no, no. You, when I asked you, you didn't say anything. No. Too late. You're going to be quick. Hello. You're digesting. The blood goes in your stomach and not in your brain. It's called the postprandial period. Everybody sleeps. Um, the flaxseed oil is, is omega-3. Um, and that omega-3 is called linolenic acid. And it's not, it's not found in your retina. It's not helping the transformation of light into electricity. But another type of omega-3, and that's DHA. DHA is called an essential fatty acid. Essential. Why essential? Because our body 
doesn't have the capacity to make it in large enough quantities. So we can take our flaxseed oil, which you know about. She's nodding. Hi, Rob. And 5% and, uh, only of your flax that you consume will be transformed into DHA. This is not sufficient. And if you go to McDonald's the same day, 0%. I have nothing against McDonald's. Just don't eat flax the same day you go to McDonald's because nothing goes into DHA. Nothing. Because the saturated fatty acid that we find in fast food, and I'm using McDonald's as an example. There are many others that we could name. I'm sure Rachel goes to all these fast food all the time. <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Okay, it was in the U.S. So at Arvase. It's okay. You never had a mama burger or a papa burger? Never. Okay. Why are you so red then? <laughs> I'm embarrassing you. <laughs> um, the saturated fatty acid, these are the ones that when you put the fat in the fridge, becomes very hard. So if you do a roast beef, and I love to keep the, uh, the juices of the roast beef and put it in the fridge, it all becomes very hard. That's saturated fatty acid. Um, that competes with our ability to make DHA. So DHA is tremendously important as half of all the fatty acids, half of all of them in the retina, in the cones and the rods, is DHA. There's a problem. The problem is that DHA, although it's tremendously important for us to see, we need it. No DHA, no vision. It's very vulnerable, it's very fragile to oxygen. When DHA is in contact with oxygen, it degrades. It oxidizes. So when oxygen reacts with a substance, it oxidizes. So oxygen reacts to your car paint, and then you get rust because the water dissolves oxygen so beautifully and allows the oxygen to be in close contact with the uh, metal, and you get rust. So, of course, we don't have rust in our eyes, but the DHA is oxidized and is no longer able to do what it does. So what we want to do is combine DHA intake via food using the ultimate source, which would be fish oil. Combine that with antioxidants. So Mother Nature has done something wonderful for us, is that she has placed in the area that we used the most for a vision, called the macula, she has placed two antioxidants, which I talked about when I mentioned the ARID study. I told you about lutein and about zeaxanthin. Well, these two molecules are found in the macula. This is the 5% of your visual field that you used to see fine details, colors, and to read. 5% of the whole space in front of you, like a little tunnel, all that. This is all you need, and this is all you use to see the very fine details. And if you look at the Snellen charts with all these letters, you've seen these charts at the ophthalmologist. That's called Snellen. You are using only 5% of your retina, and it's called a macula. And it's loaded with cones. Cones are the photoreceptors that you use for day vision and color vision and fine details. Unfortunately, in AMD, they are the one that give you the symptom that make you lose your central vision. And the problem there is that in order to see the most fine details, you are not allowed to have any blood vessels there. Because if you think of a camera or a cell phone that can take pictures, megapixels, I'm sorry, am I repeating myself? Because Rachel did attend my talk. And yes, I'm embarrassing you. Sorry, I'm going to focus. Did you empty your mouth yet, John? Okay, go. I'm just changing focus. Are you okay with that, Rachel? Okay, good. By the way, Rachel and, and John uh, worked uh, in my lab, and that's why I have the leisure of being very bad with them. Um, so what happens is when you take a picture, you want to have the most sensors in your camera, and we call them megapixels, and you heard that maybe before, pixels. So you want to pack these sensors so you have the finest 
photo, and your eyes is not are not an exception, you pack them densely so you get as many details. And if you pack them, you have no room for blood vessels because then you would have a picture of blood vessels. So I would see Rob with blood vessels crossing and then that would not be so pretty, right? Especially his beard. It would look like he just ate his spaghetti and he forgot to the noodles there and the sauce and everything. Oh, that's the blood vessels. So no blood vessels. That means that all the oxygen that cells need to live, in order to live, if I am a cell, I need oxygen and I need energy, and I get the energy from glucose. Glucose is a form of sugar, and that can't be delivered because there's no blood vessels. So cells in the human body need to be vascularized. They need to have blood vessels. But these ones, the price to pay for you to see in high details is not to have them. How in heavens does it do it? Well, it comes from the behind. So when we were traveling, and I know that Mindy did a beautiful trip. I could see she was going very deep. And if you had kept on, if you had just kept on, Mindy, after your photoreceptor, you would have met lots of blood, lots of blood called the choroid, the choroid. Choroid is all where the blood is behind the retina, still at the back of the eye. And this is where your oxygen comes from, where your glucose comes from, and this has to be distributed all the way to the cells, further away, passively. So the outcome of all that is that the oxygen level in the retina is ridiculously high, very high. So here I have a situation in which I need DHA to see, to transform electricity, uh, uh, help me. Light. Thank you, into, thank you. Is he the only one who's following? <laughs> Are you a computer engineer, Rob? Okay, there you go, he has an edge. Um, in order to do that, you need DHA to do that process. It's essential. But DHA is also the only fatty acid that we know that oxidizes, that reacts the best, unfortunately, and degrades with oxygen, unfortunately, like the rust that I was talking about. So we have a very precarious system, a very vulnerable system, that in order to, to be able to see evolution has favored our ability to see in order to survive with the price to pay that these cells we will not be able to divide have to survive in the most hostile environment. Hostile because too much oxygen kills and it forms what we call free radicals. Free radicals are byproducts of oxidation and they kill cells. So that's why as a compensation, Mother Nature says, I'm going to give you a bit of lutein and zeaxanthin. I'm going to leave it, leave it there right where the macula is. This is the only place where you find lutein and zeaxanthin in the macula, where all your cells are, your cones. But with age, we lose that. It goes down. And the DHA goes down. So we need to supplement by our food both the antioxidants, lutein and zeaxanthin, as well as the DHA together. So if someone were only to eat fish without antioxidant, that would be terrible because the DHA would rust, if you allow me the analogy, Bob, uh, Rob, Robert, Bob, okay. So that's why you need both. So what I'm saying with people with AMD, please do eat fish if you can't, if you can, if you can, <laughs> do eat fish if you can, and if you cannot, take supplements. And um, we have here, Sharon will be talking to you about a wonderful initiative that we hope other doctors will follow. It's a pro bono uh, gesture that will make available these so precious nutrients, DHA and the lutein zeaxanthin, in, in, an, in an accessible way for people who just can't afford it. So, actually, I think it would be the best moment. And Sharon, if you feel comfortable, just tell us about this amazing initiative. Uh, 
There's a uh, an exhibit outside called Core Nutrients, and uh, it was started by a. Uh, a young ophthalmologist in Vancouver who decided that his patients needed to get uh, these vitamins, did the uh, research, and uh, in collaboration with Bosch and Lam, uh, uh, they have decided to distribute through a company that they've set up called Core Nutrients. Um, there's, uh, they are the lowest priced uh, nutrients on the market. And there's a special promotion that they have that's going to be happening for the next uh, period of time. So you get f an additional $5 off a bottle. And so you can just go to the booth and get the promotional coupon and, uh, and order them. And now the best part of all this is that the proceeds from this go to macular research, and they also go to the Foundation Fighting Blindness. So this is, these are uh, great corporate partners that we now have called Core Nutrients. Thank you, Sharon. So if you go to the FAB webpage, you will find um, a list of nutrients, not only um, the DHA and the lutein zeaxanthin, but a list of nutrients that you find in food. So supplements um, are there when you have a condition, but also eating, eating healthy food, balanced, is tremendously important. We want to balance everything. So I'm going to give you some examples. A source of the lutein and zeaxanthin that is good to start with would be kale, kale and Swiss chard, kale, K-A-L-E. Um, it's this very deep green that they usually put for breakfast and you discard. It just looks good, but people just don't eat it. Um, but kale has the highest level known in food of lutein and zeaxanthin. So if I would have the best meal for someone with AMD, I would cook them salmon. And I would have it accompanied with kale. And I would perhaps finish with a nice blueberry dessert for the antioxidants found in the blueberries. And mainly the skin of the berries and the fruits, the deeper the color, the higher the concentration and the antioxidants. So berries are fantastic. And that's Saskatoon berries, definitely. Logan berry, all mulberries, all sorts of berries that we find here in the wild in, in Alberta as well as in Saskatchewan and the prairies. Um, a variety of berries. There's choke cherries or pembinas, um, deep red. These are all have antioxidants. So you eat that jointly with your um, with your fish or perhaps vary your menu. And, and try um, all other sources of antioxidants. So one thing I'd like to talk about is what John is trying to do. And uh, I'm going to be serious for one moment, John, because what John is doing is very serious. He's going towards a new field of research called personalized medicine. So what we're trying to achieve is to acknowledge that we're all different. And once we've acknowledged that we're all different, we can optimize our treatment that is tailored to your specific need and nobody else. How do we know your peculiarities? Well, we will sequence some of your genes that we have identified as being risk factors for AMD. And all the genes that we've found so far are involved in the immune system, the immune system. So we know, now we know, that AMD is an immune dysregulation disease. It's a modification of the immune system compounded by environmental factors that we're discovering, including the food that we eat, the air that we breathe. So if we smoke, we know that's the highest risk factor. That's one you can change. Your age, you can't change that. That's a factor that you cannot change. What you eat, you can change. And your genetics, you cannot change. So we can divide in what's changeable, modifiable, and non-modifiable. So if I summarize, the non-modifiable factors are definitely the age. We can't stop aging. And as we get older, 65 years and older, 
one in 10 will have AMD. And as we get 75 years of age, one in four, 25% of the population will have AMD after 75 years of age. So it's, it's, it's important that we prepare for that as a society. As we're getting older because of the baby boomers and the demographics in 2020, we will be about 20% of Albertans will be elderly, 65 and over. So that's what you can't modify and in the genetics. So John will be screening the genes and understanding if someone with a specific mutation, specific sequence of that gene responds better or not to DHA supplementation or to certain level of antioxidants and how the AMD progresses and hopefully try to make it stable and not progress. And we were talking about um, the Avastin and the Lucentis. These, these are anti-VEGF. Um, VEGF is vascular endothelial growth factor. I'm sorry about these words, but all my speech should be recorded. I don't see any recording machine, but it should be recorded and should be on the website of ffb.ca. So these pharmaceutical agents that your doctors use in your wet AMD eye, uh, there's a huge debate. Is Lucentis better than Avastin? Lucentis is way more expensive than Avastin, but do I justify changing Avastin to Lucentis? People say one or the other. So what John will do is simply correlate what is your gene sequence and how do you respond to either of them and find what's the best to use, as simple as that. So that's what we call personalized medicine. He will measure in your blood your DHA level and other fatty acids and antioxidants and correlate that with your progression of AMD. Okay, so I, I just wanted, before we go to questions, to tell you about omega-3, how important it is, and especially DHA, but about a problem in our society, and I'm talking about the Western society, which is processed food. And I did, and I apologize for people who did attend my talk this morning to repeat myself, but I think it's very important to say that we have a very, very unbalanced diet when we eat only processed food. The reason being is the ubiquitous it's like everywhere, you will find soya and corn derived products, byproducts of corn and soya. And the ratio of omega 6 to omega 3 is what I want to talk about. I told you that omega 3 is very important for phototransduction, but omega 6 also play a role. But they got it, and you find them in the retina, but you got to have one and one. Ratio. So I got to have as much omega-6 as omega-3 to have the best phototransduction, to have the best vision, and the best heart condition as well. General health requires a ratio of one-to-one. -one. And when you measure in our blood the ratio of omega-6 to 3, instead of one-to-one, -one, you find a range from 5 to 1 all the way to 15 to 1, in North Americans, in the USA, and in Canada. And you go to Italy, and you don't see that. That's the Mediterranean diet, where they don't eat as much processed food. So six in our society ends up being way too high. Six is very, very important and very good, but it needs to be equal to three. Corn has a ratio in corn of omega-6 to 3. So I will always put omega-6 first and then 3 of 47 to 1. 47 to 1. I challenge people in this room to find a processed food that does not have a corn-derived product in it. I challenge you. And I said that that's bad. That's very bad. So I'm not saying be afraid of processed food. I'm saying reduce your consumption of processed foods as you can. And people like FFB, by putting the information out, is a way to make the government aware 
that, that this is a, an unacceptable situation. Now, they do not lobby, but it's an indirect way. Education, education empowers people. As you go to the FAB.ca, you learn, because they have the mandate. That's the third mandate you're talking about, is to educate people. Education is power, because you go to the store, and when you buy, you vote. Choosing what you going to eat is a way of voting because if people are educated and they stop buying processed food, you know what? The people who make it are going to stop at some point or do something. I mean, McDonald's changed their, their Happy Meals in a certain way because they responded to the demand. There was pressure. So I'm not a politician. I'm saying that processed food in large quantity, and, and some people can't get away with it because they live in remote regions like, like the Inuits, you know, in Nunavut. Food is ridiculously expensive, so the cheapest food they can buy is processed food. They don't have much choice. So the ratio of 6 to, to, to 3 is 47 to 1 for corn, and for soya, it's 7 to 1. 7 to 1. So if you're going to buy fish, that is farm fish from the Atlantic, I'm going to ask you a question. What do they feed the fish when they farm them? Soya. Soya is the main source of food for fish. What do they feed the cattle? Corn. So when you eat beef that has been corn-fed, you eat a very unbalanced omega-6 to 3. So again, your budget dictates what you eat sometime, and it's hard to find affordable, uh, free-range, organic-grown cow. I know that we grow some wonderful cows here um, that are not cow-fed, that are grass-fed and free-range, free and they're just more expensive. So I think it's a balance. It's just don't go crazy about it. We do eat processed food in my house. We do eat corn. We do eat tofu, which is soya. It's just a matter of balance. Just and the last thing I want to end up with is the immune system is very much reinforced and boosted when we laugh. Because laughing increases your, your T cell count. So they ask people to watch Jerry Seinfeld, Seinfeld for one hour, and then they measure their white blood cells, and they find we're going up after one hour of Jerry Seinfeld. So there you go. And why do I say that? It's because if you start to worry too much about what you eat, and then you might do the opposite. You might be so stressed and so concerned that you're putting your system down. So laugh about it, have a philosophical approach to it, try your best, be educated, promote what FFB does, talk to your friends about FFB so they go to their website and they learn about all these tools. So open for question. Are chocolates good for you? Chocolates are interesting. Oh, no. Chocolate are, <laughs> <laughs> chocolate are, are, are full of, of saturated um, fatty good. acid. And it's not, we do need saturated fatty acid. We do need it. Cheese has a lot of fat saturated and beef has. And, and that's fine. That's fine. It's all in moderation. Chocolate has many, many compounds that are taught to affect our limbic system. This is emotion. And a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And when you increase dopamine, you're just more euphoric or more happy. Oh, well, you see, I handed out chocolates, so you didn't. And chocolates <laughs> also have antioxidants in them. They do. They do. But the thing is, they, some of them uh, have lots of sugar. So too much sugar can also cause diabetes, which, which can cause uh, blindness due to mm -hmm. too much diabetes. But we're talking about moderation. I do eat yeah. chocolate. Red wine, good? Well, red wine, I want to tell you, it makes you happy just because you're relaxing and you're drinking yeah. a bit of alcohol. Now, I'm going to take the <laughs> microphone here. <laughs> red wine, uh, Dr. Grieve, interestingly, said that he likes one glass of red wine a, a day. Um, there's a compound, resveratrol, resveratrol, found in red wine. And uh, the big thing was, wow, resveratrol is one of the most powerful 
antioxidant. And you know how much I was raving about antioxidants, how important they are. The problem is you would have to drink 12 bottles a day <laughs> to reach enough resveratrol level to have a physiological effect. So companies... And the problem with that is you're laughing <laughs> and you boost your immune system. It's all good. So um, there are companies out there that are um, isolating the resveratrol, and they have tested it in different conditions. It has not been tested formally on AMD yet. But um, again, I think if Mother Nature wanted to put resveratrol in, in, the, um, in the grapes, um, at the dose that it is, uh, we don't want to interfere too much by concentrating in a, such an unnatural way. I think eating grapes is very important. So the grapes do have resveratrol, the red grapes especially, and they also have anthocyanins, which is this antioxidant that is in the berry. So we have a wonderful meal. So we're going to have our salmon. We're going to have our kale. We're going to have wonderful maybe uh, grapes and maybe a nice Merlot jelly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a sherry is good, too. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Yves Sauvé. Uh, several years ago when we first met and he spoke and, and uh, just knocked everybody out, he said to me, any time you want me to speak anywhere, I'll do it. And, uh, and so he does this uh, out of the goodness of his heart. Thank you very much. And then we're going to move across the hall uh, and to, the, uh, to join everyone else for the next session. Thank you very much, Eve. You're welcome. And